and uh, good uh, Tuesday morning and a warm welcome to uh, virtual cardiovascular grand rounds. Um, today is a, a, a really uh, interesting format and something that we haven't done before uh, previously. And uh, I have to give credit to Eric Velasquez for uh, suggesting uh, this format. And this is something that I think will be of great benefit uh, to all of our faculty. Uh, today, we're uh, pleased to sort of present uh, uh, overview or highlights uh, from the recent ACC meeting. Um, this is something that we're going to try to do moving forward um, after each of the major um, cardiovascular meetings, uh, really as a way of being able to translate uh, new research, uh, new findings, new information, new ways of thinking um, that come up from these meetings and have that be something uh, that we're presenting to our faculty, both those who are able to attend the meetings and others who are not able to attend the meetings or who cannot follow, you know, kind of the wide breadth of programming that is usually available at these meetings. Um, we're very fortunate to have uh, some of our key faculty are really kind of taking the lead today to summarize some of these highlights from ACC 2021. And I'd like to thank them all uh, for taking the time uh, to do this program today. So without uh, further ado, we all know these people, so no need for any long introductions. Uh, we're going to get started. And um, the order of uh, presentations today will be um, Jim Freeman uh, leading off first, uh, Ryan Papal, Tariq, Tariq Ahmad, uh, Rohan Kira, and finally, Alexandra Lansky. I think what we will do just in the interest of time is to allow these presentations, uh, maybe one or two questions at the most afterwards, and then move on to the next presentation so that that way we're able to fit in all of the information that we have to fit in in this hour. So with that, we'll get started. And uh, Jim, uh, the floor is yours. Um, well, thanks, everyone. Um, so today I'll be talking about one-year clinical outcomes following Watchman left atrial appendage occlusion. And um, this is work that came out of the steering committee for the um, LAO registry. It was presented by Matthew Price, my colleague at, uh, at ACC. And, um, and Jepta and I were, were very involved in the development of the science and a lot of the methods and, and then are, have been very heavily involved in the paper writing and, and uh, the submission. So that should be coming out in, um, uh, in press fairly soon. We hope um, we're, we're, um, we've got to revise and resubmit at uh, JAMA Cardiology. So hopefully we'll get the paper out soon. But um, so the background on this is that um, the pivotal trials in the left atrial appendage occlusion space uh, were PROTECT AF and PREVAIL. And um, these were really designed as equivalency trials between warfarin and left atrial appendage occlusion. Patients had to be candidates for long-term warfarin. And overall, they were they were actually low to moderate risk uh, for stroke on average. Uh, average chat of vascular was about 2.3 in those studies. By contrast, um, when the Watchman device was approved by the FDA, CMS made a coverage decision that actually mandated uh, that patients had to um, not be candidates for long-term anticoagulation. They had to have some relative contraindication to anticoagulation that made um, this a necessity. And, um, and they had to have a chad suvas score of three or greater. And so um, the result of that uh, is uh, data that we published um, actually in JAK and presented a year ago as a featured science presentation at ACC 2020. Um, and that was data showing that on average patients um, in the real world that are getting the Watchman device are much older and sicker than uh, those from the, uh, the clinical trials. So several years older, um, Many of these patients had a prior history of stroke, so almost 30% of them, uh, almost 40% uh, had uh, diabetes. And very importantly, about 70% um, of them had a history of prior clinically relevant bleeding. The mean chads 2 vas score uh, was 4.6, and depending on what cut of the data we've used from the registry, um, it ranges between 4.6 and 4.8. Um, average had blood score was three. So these are patients that are truly between a rock and a hard place. Um, but again, I think the important piece is that they're pretty different than um, the patients uh, that were treated in the randomized trials. And so we then went on, um, and uh, part of that presentation last year was to show that um, there were very reassuring rates of major and hospital adverse events. Uh, um, adverse event rate about 2.16% in terms of major complications, the most common being 
pericardial effusion and major bleeding. It's important to note, actually, we're on um, now the, over the last six to 12 months, um, we've transitioned to the Watchman Flex, the next generation device. And that's um, been widely um, thought to uh, have a, a lower rate of pericardial effusion. And there was a trial called the Pinnacle Flex study that um, bore that out and showed a rate of pericardial effusion that was uh, substantially lower than this. So this procedure is getting safer, um, but uh, the good news is that the real world data um, is, is very reassuring and consistent or better than what we saw in the clinical trials, at least when we looked at in-hospital adverse event rates. So this study was really um, meant to look at uh, midterm adverse event rates. And so we wanted to look at um, adverse event rates out to one year and see if the device uh, performs as well or, or possibly even better than what we saw in the randomized trials. And in particular in this older and sicker uh, uh, population in the real world. So uh, um, this is an observational cohort study of patients who underwent attempted or successful Watchman implantation in the registry and were eligible for one-year follow-up. So we, we didn't mandate one-year follow-up, but they had to uh, be eligible for it. And um, primary endpoint was ischemic stroke. Secondary endpoints were death and major bleeding. It's important to note that um, this registry is uh, unique and that it does have active follow-up through two years. And we also... Um, developed and employ um, a central adjudication system using a computer-based algorithm. I'm working on that paper and need to get that submitted, um, but working on that with, with Jephtha and Alexandra and others um, here at Yale. Um, and then um, we did use manual adjudication when registry dead elements are incomplete or conflicting. The methods um, that we use in the uh, paper are cumulative incidence rates. So that's essentially looking at rates of adverse events divided by the follow-up for a given patient. Um, and then the Kaplan-Meier estimates. And we think the Kaplan-Meier estimates are really the gold standard for this type of work. And that's what I'll be presenting today. Um, so the registry has uh, captures follow-up visits at 45 days plus minus two weeks, 180 days minus 30 and uh, plus 60, and then um, 365 days plus minus 60 days. And um, importantly, the rates of follow-up are actually pretty good for a real world registry or, or, or very good, I should say. About 90% at 45 days, um, about 80% at six months, and then about 70% at, at, um, at 365 days. So overall, a good uh, capture of follow-up, but again, we're using the Kaplan-Meier estimate. So um, if patients are lost to follow-up, that's accounted for in our methodology. Um, in total, we had 31,000 patient years of follow-up, and um, and then at least 94 uh, or 94 percent of patients had at least one follow-up visit at, at one of those time points. Um, importantly, patients who had follow-up and didn't have follow-up were very well matched in terms of their baseline characteristics, and so I, I think that's important to make sure that um, the patients that we're losing were probably not markedly different and probably had similar outcomes. So we think this data is generalizable. So um, the primary endpoint here is uh, freedom from ischemic stroke, and, and the one-year rate of ischemic stroke was 1.53%. So we put that in the context of um, the previous studies. Protect AF and Prevail um, had slightly lower risk patients, but had a very similar rate of ischemic stroke. The Evolution Registry had um, a similar risk profile, so Chad Subasco of about four and a half, as did the CAT2 Registry. And, uh, and again, they had very similar rates uh, of ischemic stroke, ranging from um, around uh, 1.3 up to uh, 1.8 or so. So we sat right in the middle of that. And I think um, this is really uh, very reassuring that our data is extremely consistent with what was seen in the randomized trials and in um, some of these other uh, smaller registry experiences. So this is just as a, rem uh, a reminder that um, the expected rate in, in patients with a chas 2 vas uh, score of uh, 4.6 um, of ischemic stroke would be about 6.6%. And so this 1.53% uh, re represents um, a 77% relative risk reduction. And I think just highlights uh, the effectiveness of this therapy. This is also, I think, for those of you that are interested in this, very consistent with the rates of ischemic stroke um, with the DOACs. Uh, and so when we look at like a meta-analysis of um, all the DOAC trials, what we know is that the, Chad, the, um, the rate of ischemic stroke was about 1.3 to 1.4% in um, patients with similar risk profile. So I think that's reassuring. In terms of other adverse events, the rate of major bleeding was about 6.24%. I think it's important to realize that a lot of those bleeding events are clustered in the um, early period after the device is implanted. We treat people with anticoagulants um, 
uh, so anticoagulants and aspirin is the recommendation or at least um, some anticoagulant. Some patients are treated with um, DAPT, but there's a fairly intensive period of um, antithrombotic therapy in the short-term period after device implant to prevent thrombus forming on the surface of the devices as they're being endothelialized. And I think we have a bunch of science to do in this space. We actually presented at AHA a, a feature scientific presentation looking at post-procedural anticoagulation and showed that if we used anticoagulation without um, aspirin, um, then uh, the rates of bleeding were substantially lower, actually. And, uh, and so I think a lot of work to be done to try and improve outcomes in that uh, periprocedural period in particular. The all-cause mortality rate was about um, uh, 8.5%. You can see very steady rates of, um, of mortality. Um, importantly, about 60% of the mortality was non-cardiovascular. And, um, and, and you know, this is an expected rate of mortality um, in this uh, population that is uh, relatively old, you know, 76 and with a lot of comorbidities. In terms of limitations, we had incomplete follow-up, which may result in underestimates of event rates. We talked about the fact that there were no differences in thromboembolic and bleeding risk between the patients with and without follow-up. The Kaplan-Meier estimates are also used to account for variable follow-up. So we think that this is um, really not a huge limitation, but is important to, um, to note. Adverse event rates are set reported, so it's possible that there's some underreporting there, of course. Um, but uh, we use the event adjudication process, and there is um, uh, site auditing of sites. About 5% of sites in the registry are audited every year, and they do um, billing uh, claims uh, auditing and whatnot um, as a way of capturing whether events are being underreported. And overall, um, really haven't found any substantial underreporting. And then routine uh, post-procedural pharmacotherapy likely contributes in part to stroke risk reduction observed in the first year. So um, the fact that we use anticoagulation um, and or um, antiplatelet agents at a, a more intense level in the first few months may uh, lower the rates of uh, stroke. And so it may be that in years two, three, four, and five, the rates of stroke are a little bit higher. So in conclusion, thromboembolic events at one year are relatively infrequent and uh, consistent with prior trial and small-scale registry experiences. And we think this data um, from the real world is really very reassuring. Um, bleeding and death uh, unrelated to thromboembolism are more common and should be incorporated into patient-centered decision-making. These are um, you know, important events that occur at non-insubstantial rates and need to be part of um, how we think about whether we use this therapy or not. Thank you. Any questions at all? Hey, Jim, it's John. I don't know if you can hear me. Yeah. Just a quick question on the site auditing. Is that happening within this? It's one of the areas within the TVT registry where to anybody's knowledge, it's never actually happened that somebody's gone on site to audit it. And at least if it has, no one's admitted to it and there's never been any data published about the accuracy of that because obviously as a as a, as studies like this that are all site reported it would be interesting to see what that is and it should be a lot of patients five percent so i was wondering if you could just comment on that yeah so it's five percent of sites john it's not five percent of patients um and so um yeah you just happen to not have talked to the sites that where they got audited um and there's some there's also some strategic auditing of sites that um where they're, for example, not they're reporting like no adverse events, um, those sites will get audited more frequently. So it may be that the people you're talking to um, are not the folks that are getting audited. Um, but yeah, no, they're definitely occurring. Um, there is data, I'm happy to send you references on, on that process um, that have been done and published from other registries. Um, and, and it's definitely occurring. The primary mechanism for assessing whether um, things are being underreported is looking at CMS billing claims. And I should say that um, actually Kamal Afridi has submitted a K award and, and actually got some YCCI funding um, for work that we've been doing with Kamal, um, looking at the active um, uh, data capture of adverse events through the registry compared with CMS billing claims to sort of validate in both directions. Um, the, the two methods for, um, for doing this. And, um, and that, that parallels some of the work that he had done up in Boston, um, doing the same thing with trial data. So uh, that's really exciting work. We're really optimistic about that grant and, and really excited um, to get going with that work. That work was held up because CMS, there was a data agreement with ACC that got held up during the last administration that seems to have 
um, all of a sudden gotten better. And we also applied for and got um, uh, uh, CMS data through a different mechanism. So we're really excited to get moving forward with that data again to, to confirm these findings. But um, does that answer your question, John? No, it does. I'd love to hear about the uh, separately about the CMS. It's, you know, it, it's in the TVP registry. The initial agreement was that it would all be cross-checked with CMS. Yeah. And then that stopped two years ago. So separately, I'd love to hear about what you've been able to do with this registry because that's been an issue with the TVT registry. So thank you. That was really Absolutely. Thanks, everyone. Jim, I have a okay. question. Uh, yeah. Thanks a lot, Jim. Oh. Uh, it was an excellent talk. Uh, so I'm, I have... sorry. I'm sorry? Uh, I'm sorry? I was just going to, uh, sorry, Aria, to to cut in, I'm just aware of the fact that we have four other talks. Okay, okay. So I'm just gonna take one question and maybe we can put some questions in the chat and uh, Jim and other speakers can respond in the chat. Thank you. Yeah, or just reach out by email or something. Okay, great. We'll, we'll move on to the next speaker. Thank you, Brian. Great, hi everyone, good morning. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to present the, the results from the 30-day uh, TriSend study. This is an early feasibility study for a tricuspid valve replacement. Uh, next slide. So by way of background, uh, transcatheter options for tricuspid regurgitation have started to emerge over the last several years, especially in Europe, um, to treat this unmet need. Uh, transcatheter tricuspid valve repair, specifically with the tricuspid clip, uh, both from Edwards and Abbott have uh, demonstrated good early results, but uh, not as predictable as one would like. And just as a plug for our program, we did uh, recently launch as a site for the Triluminate study, which is edge to edge repair with, my, with a tricuspid clip for tricuspid regurgitation. So any patients with uh, even mildly symptomatic uh, TR, we'd love to see them in clinic. Um, in this study specifically, uh, tri TriSend looks at tricuspid valve replacement as an alternative for repair in elderly patients who are high risk. So this is the, the valve that was used in the system is the Evoke valve from Edwards. Um, it is a 28 French uh, device that is delivered through the right fem common femoral vein. Um, it has atraumatic anchors. They're nitinol finger-like projections with a polymer coating on the outside um, that are designed to scoop underneath the cordae and leaflets. And then the valve itself is a conformable nitinol frame that is progressively released and anchors to the leaflets themselves. Um, the tricuspid valve is very unique. It's different than the left-sided valves. It doesn't have a firm annulus to anchor to. Uh, the septal leaflet is really the only anchor and that is because of the muscle. Uh, but this valve anchors into the actual leaflets and cords. Next slide. Uh, so to go over the study overview, it's prospective single armed multi-center trial to evaluate the safety and performance uh, of this transfemoral system. It has traditional tri trial oversight with the central screening committee uh, a core lab for the echocardiography, a, a clinical events committee, and a, da a data safety monitoring board. And so patients were evaluated based on anatomy, symptoms, recent admission, um, and if their anatomy was appropriate, they could be included in the study. Uh, so the enrollment, there were 56 patients enrolled and the data had 30 day follow up on 47 patients. So uh, they could have moderate or worse tricuspid regurgitation to be included in the study. However, most of the patients had severe or greater. The study used the recently adopted five grade uh, system of grading tricuspid regurgitation, which is mild, moderate, severe, massive, and torrential. Uh, so 92% of patients had severe or greater. Uh, next slide. Access was right femoral vein uh, in all of, all of the patients. Device success uh, was 98%. That is uh, getting the device deployed and the system removed. Procedural success was 94%, which is having the device implanted, uh, system removed, and no adverse events during the hospital stay. And device time was just over an hour. Next slide. Um, uh, length of stay was three days. Um, so cardiovascular mortality, 
was uh, only one patient had, had a cardiovascular mortality in the 30 days of the 53 patients studied. Um, the major events that were noted, uh, you can see 22.6% had severe bleeding. Now this was uh, defined as having, uh, and none of these bleeding events were significant in terms of life-threatening bleeds. They included um, hematuria, nosebleeds, GI bleeds. The challenging thing for this device, and I think one of the limiting factors for this platform, is going to be anticoagulation after the valve uh, in the follow-up period. Uh, Coumadin is required and with an INR goal of 2.5 to 3.5, um, and that's because of the bulky nature of the device and some of the empty space uh, that is part of the valve apparatus. So to prevent strokes, they aimed for a higher INR goal. And I think that was the result of, uh, and ultimately resulted in some of these higher bleeding complications. Um, luckily, none were life-threatening, as I mentioned. Uh, All-cause mortality was just over 3%. So in terms of the primary endpoint, looking at significant reduction in the TR severity, so you can see most of the patients, 92%, were severe or greater in the initial phase. And at 30 days, 98% uh, had none or mild uh, tricuspid regurgitation. Uh, and this is a uh, cross-sectional image of what the valve looks like after it's deployed. Uh, next slide. Next slide. So this is an interesting slide. It shows baseline discharge and 30-day data on some of the echo criteria. So the gradient across the valve was 1.9 at baseline and up to 3.8 at 30 days. And that seemed to be consistent between discharge and 30 days. Uh, PA systolic came down from about 40 to 34. Um, you can see the hepatic vein flow reversal was not, uh, present in almost all patients at 98% at baseline. And no patients had flow re reversal at, at uh, 30 days. The IVC diameter came down from 27 to 21. Uh, the RVN diastolic pressure was came down as well from 41 to 36. The RV systolic function, thats that, I think this is going to take a lot of teasing out to understand how the RV changes as these devices are placed. Same with the tricuspid valve edge-to-edge -edge repair. Um, but the most patients had some at least mild dysfunction at baseline. Um, and there was a reduction in function at discharge and then some resolution of function in a 30 day or return of function. And I think it's hard to know how that's going to play out in the data in terms of what that valve does in terms of the ability to the, of the RV to contract. Are we just seeing changes in the RV uh, trying to look at traditional echo measurements, but really it's just the rigidity of the valve itself that's preventing us from accurately assess the tricuspid flow uh, or the RV function because we're seeing a, a resolution of hepatic vein flow reversal, for instance. So I think overall there's some improvement in the RV function. Um, and then in terms of how patients feel afterwards, which I think is really the main uh, take home point here is are patients feeling better? And overall, yes, the answer is yes. And 77% of patients are a class one or class two symptoms uh, at 30 days, and which is a really significant increase uh, or significant change given that we don't have a lot of treatment options for patients with significant TR. Um, the six minute walk test and the quality of life score both increase significantly significantly at 30 days, uh, which really is spectacular. Um, next slide. And so in conclusion, this uh, early feasibility tri-send uh, tricuspid valve replacement study um, shows that 92% of patients re, uh, had severe tricuspid regurgitation at baseline and had 30-day favorable results uh, with reduction of the uh, tricuspid regurgitation in 94% of patients. Um, and it was shown to be a safe procedure. Uh, and I, I did note that it's in a, a fair number of patients had some bleeding issues, and I think that's related to the INR goal that's necessary. Uh, most of these were not clinically significant. Um, and overall, patients feel better. I think that's the main take-home message from this, is that the once-forgotten tricuspid valve, I think, is, is finally getting some of the attention that it deserves in terms of getting some direct treatment. And I think the exciting part for, of this for us and those of us who are involved in the repair studies as well is looking to see what happens to the RV function, uh, pulmonary pressures, et cetera. Um, I think uh, RV failure is something that a lot of us don't understand as well as we'd like to in terms of improving outcomes and helping patients feel better. And I think some of these repair and replacement studies are offering a platform and an arena for studying um, this physiology. Um, I think it's an exciting uh, space that we'll be able to partner with our uh, heart failure colleagues as well. Um, uh, next uh, bullet point, please, Liz.
I think that's and and really the uh, overall it was a favorable experience uh, for the the study itself. And they're moving on to the TriSend two study, which is the pivotal trial for this platform, uh, which is a 750 uh, patient study randomized to medical treatment versus valve replacement. So great, thank you. I'll take any questions. We may have room for one question. I tried to move quickly to kind of in the interest of time. Good, we'll take questions at the end, that's fine. All right, excellent, Ryan. Thank you so very much uh, for that review. Uh, we'll move on to the next uh, speaker here. Please ask the question. Can everyone see my slides? Yes, we can see them, Tark. Okay. Good morning, uh, everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me uh, uh, to, uh, to talk about this important trial. Uh, I'll be uh, giving you a brief overview of a study that I was not involved in, but uh, uh, was watching very closely, and that's the use of Entresto in patients with advanced heart failure. <clears throat> this is the live trial that was uh, uh, coordinated by the Heart Failure Network. Um, so many of you know about uh, Paradigm HF. This was a big study in the field of heart failure. Uh, it examined the use of Contresto in patients uh, with uh, a heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and was a, in, in, in our field, known as a blockbuster. Uh, it improved all the outcomes that they were looking for. And uh, as you can see on the right side, uh, over just the duration of the study, uh, which generally is not that long, they, would, uh, they could prevent one death from cardiovascular disease by treating 32 patients and, uh, and pro one primary outcome by, by, uh, by treating 21. So uh, this was a very effective medication uh, for patients with heart failure. One important thing to keep in mind that many people don't realize is that Paradigm HF had a run-in period. So if you were not able to tolerate the highest dose of Entresto, which is 97103, which I know that many people realize is a very high dose, um, you did not enter the, the clinical trial. A uh, second study uh, led by Eric, uh, Pioneer HF, also uh, showed uh, dramatic improvements uh, in NT-proBNP levels, as well as uh, clinical outcomes amongst patients who are hospitalized for acute heart failure. So a slightly higher um, uh, risk patient population. However, uh, most people realize that the, we still did not know whether Entresto is beneficial in patients with advanced heart failure. So once you end up having kind of class four symptoms and, uh, and, and uh, progressing towards stage D heart failure and stage heart failure, there was no data on whether Entresto would help in those situations. Uh, just to reinforce, I have to um, uh, just put this out there. Uh, for patients with advanced heart failure, inotropes have never been shown to extend life. We don't even know if they make you feel better. So those, they're not an option for patients uh, with uh, advanced heart failure. There's limited treatments when you get to stage uh, D heart failure. And this is kind of what we see on our end where patients are getting hospitalized. They're not able to tolerate uh, a GDMT. Uh, if they have a defibrillator, they may get defibrillator shocks and then get started on inotropes. In those situations, the only two treatments that have been consistently been shown to extend life um, are heart transplantation and ventricular assist device. So if a medication could, could prolong uh, the need for those therapies, uh, obviously there was a lot of interest in it. And that led to the, the LIFE trial. So the LIFE trial was testing the hypothesis that Sucubitril, Valsartan, and Tresto would improve levels of anti pro bnp uh, and clinical status in patients uh, treated with Valsartan alone uh, in patients with HEFREF and NYHA class four symptoms. Uh, these were the inclusion criteria for this study. If uh, I've uh, made a red box around uh, the ones that they felt uh, would uh, imply that the patient has advanced heart failure. So this was a, 
of one of the few studies that uh, allowed for chronic inotropic therapy at time of enrollment. Uh, patients would have had to have more than one, one or more heart failure hospitalizations in the last six months, a very low ejection fraction, or a peak VO2 of less than six, uh, 16 uh, for men and 14 for women, and low six minute walk distance. Um, uh, the exclusion criteria were, were mostly around uh, things that might interfere with uh, entresto and very advanced renal disease. This is the study overview and protocol. Um, there was a run-in period just to make sure that people were, patients were able to tolerate uh, low-dose sacubitril valsartan, but the important difference between this and Paradigm HF was that they, they did not require the highest dose for you to be able to enter the study. So if you were able to tolerate uh, the lowest dose of Pintresto, then you would stay uh, on it. Uh, this is the flow of the study. So 200 and, uh, 462 patients were screened uh, and uh, uh, at 38 centers. Um, importantly, they had to go down from a uh, previously um, uh, planned 400 patient study to 335 because of COVID. Um, and, and that led to a reduction in their power for, uh, for being able to tell a, a difference between uh, either arm. So these were the primary outcomes. Uh, uh, neither treatment with Sacubitril, Valsartan, or Valsartan decreased uh, median anti-pro BNP levels below uh, baseline. It's a very interesting finding given that uh, you know, Sacubitril uh, targets the natriuretic peptide uh, pathways. So absolutely really no difference whatsoever compared to baseline levels of anti-pro BNP. Uh, when you look at clinical outcomes, again, this was not the primary outcome, but these were secondary outcomes. There was really no difference uh, between Zucubitril, Valsartan, and, and Valsartan for these patients. In fact, some may even argue there was a trend towards, uh, uh, towards worse outcomes, but uh, did not meet statistical significance in these in this small uh, uh, cohort. So the key findings uh, here are that uh, neither uh, Valsartan or uh, Sucubitril Valsartan and Tresto reduced median levels of anti-pro BNP below the baseline level. Uh, so the area under the curve for proportional change was, was uh, no different between them. And, and again, surprisingly, they, did not, they had no impact on levels um, uh, at all. There were no differences in the secondary efficacy endpoints, uh, days out of the hospital, free from heart failure events, uh, really no differences in rates of cardiovascular death or, or heart failure hospitalizations. Uh, slightly increased uh, higher rates of hypotension as you might expect from, from Entresto uh, and slightly high levels of hyperkalemia uh, as well in the space. Wow. So the key discussion points uh, uh, that I'd like to leave with you with are, are, first of all, this was a very, very small study. So uh, only 335 patients, and it was also stopped early because of COVID-19. Uh, so you have to keep that in mind. And uh, this has been uh, the Achilles heel of most of the Heart Failure Network studies where uh, they've, uh, they've, they've uh, had too small of uh, of numbers to be able to really kind of uh, make meaningful, uh, you know, uh, uh, kind of conclusions about what they're studying uh, in many cases. So the NYHA class also is very, very poorly defined. It's not clear, uh, uh, you know, what a class four patient is. And uh, certainly like looking at the anti-pro BNP levels and the tolerated doses of Sucubitril Valsartan um, in this patient population, I'm not entirely convinced that most of these patients were end-stage heart failure because uh, the average dose of, uh, of uh, Sucubitril Valsartan achieved was at least the, the, uh, the mid-dose of uh, um, 4951. And then uh, the, the way that this would change my practice would be that I still feel that Sucubitril Valsartan and Tresto should be the first line of, uh, of treatment for patients uh, with most patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, along with beta blocker, MRA, SGLT2 inhibitors. Those are the um, only medications that have consistently been shown to improve outcomes uh, in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction as a first line of therapy. Uh, when patients are not able to tolerate these therapies, so they, they 
you know, can only be on lower doses of these medications and they start getting hypotension or they're starting to show signs of advanced uh, heart failure, uh, I think we should still push to have them referred uh, to uh, uh, the advanced heart failure group uh, so that we can evaluate them to see um, if they're candidates for, um, for you know, heart transplant bad. And even uh, actually, importantly, I've, had, I've sent uh, several patients in the last two weeks to Ryan Capel because uh, many of these patients need uh, benefit from valvular interventions, for example. So there are quite a lot of new therapies uh, uh, for this patient population that can slow down the progression once they uh, reach advanced heart failure. So thank you very much for inviting me. I'd uh, love to take any questions or comments. <laughs> Tarek, uh, thank you very much uh, for that. And, uh, you know, if you have any questions for Tarek, if you can just put those in the chat, maybe we'll have time right at the end to round off uh, for a couple of questions. I'm going to move on uh, to Rohan Kiran. Uh, Um, hey, every, good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm actually build on uh, the ARNI pathway that I thought, you know, beautifully presented and gave a lot of background information on. And the specific population that the study that I'm presenting today focuses on is the post-MI population among those who have either LV systolic dysfunction or have evidence of clinical heart failure. This was presented by Mark Pfeffer on the first day of ACC. Uh, this, the trial has not yet been published, so the information I present today has to be taken with a grain of salt that I don't have the extent, the complete extent of all the methodology available, although method study is available, and I've actually coded that in the presentation. So one of the key you know, highlights that everybody is uh, keenly aware of is that AS inhibitor and, and angiotensin receptor blockers have had a long-standing history of success in the post-MI heart failure population. And this, is, this was shown across different ways of defining heart failure, including LV systolic dysfunction or clinical or radiologic edge heart failure. And this was seen across multiple different ACE inhibitors and ARBs. And as uh, Tariq presented, since the ACE ARBs were around for a couple of decades, the last five to six years has seen a transformative change in heart failure management with the emergence of saccular valsartan and the landmark study being Paradigm found that there were substantial reductions in multiple outcomes of CV death, heart failure hospitalizations, and individual components of the outcomes too, to the point that it has, uh, a single trial has modified how we treat patients with heart failure now. And this was built on further by the ability to use this drug, even in acute settings safely, with evidence of biomarker improvement suggestive that this drug can be used in acute decompensated heart failure. Uh, this was a study led by Eric, and it also found that in an exploratory outcome of serious clinical events, there was evidence of reduction in death, heart failure readmissions, and referrals for advanced heart failure. So there was an evidence suggestive of uh, uh, reduced deterioration among patients with, uh, uh, with acute decompensated heart failure. Uh, however, the uh, drug hasn't had consistent success. I have to highlight that the Paragon Heart Failure Study that was published a couple of years ago that tested the HEFPEF population failed to find a, a benefit in the in composite of total heart failure hospitalizations and CV death at a pre-specified uh, alpha of 0.05. Uh, although there was there was a suggestion that saccharidal valsartan may have a, a fewer numerical events. And so this is the uh, the setting in which the Paradise MI trial came through. Uh, it enrolled uh, patients with any form of acute myocardial infarction, including STEMI or non-STEMI, within seven days of presentation, who had either a left ventricular systolic uh, EF of 40% or less, or had uh, evidence of pulmonary congestion on exam. They also added risk enhancers, and the methodologic papers kind of mentioned that the risk enhancers were designed initially to ensure that these will be individuals who would have uh, the likelihood of sustained heart failure or sustained systolic dysfunction at, even after revascularization. As we all know, quite a few people may have early systolic dysfunction that may not persist as the, as the care pro, 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 prog uh, progresses and revascularization is done. And these are features that we all recognize, including advanced age, reduced renal function, uh, significantly dropped EF, and evidence of uh, uh, large areas of infarction or uh, aneurysmias. Uh, 
And some of the major exclusions, which were key here, is that this study did not study those individuals who had prior heart failure or had evidence of clinical instability, thereby specifically focusing on the individuals who you would start the uh, interest or ASNR for the low EF in the MI setting. And uh, this trial enrolled uh, around uh, 15 and 900 individuals who were either in, uh, uh, randomized to saturated valsartan or ramipril. Uh, the dose was uh, lower in, in this uh, than, than the prior studies. And uh, there was no running involved. Uh, this is con in contrast to what Tariq had mentioned with the paradigm study. And then the study had was an endpoint driven, uh, was an event driven trial and had a median follow up around 23 months. Uh, the outcome was different as well. It focused on CV death, heart for hospitalizations, and outpatient development of heart failure. And the last one is different because it kind of focuses on the fact if you uh, increase somebody's diuretic in the outpatient set setting and they remain on the uh, increased dose for around 28 days or more. Uh, that was how they defined the composite down, uh, endpoint of death and heart failure. And then the study did have broad recruitment, at least from four out of five continents, with North America um, and Latin America being, uh, being the, the smaller component and the predominant recruitment from Western and Central Europe. But there were some enrollment from uh, Asia Pacific as well. The, I don't have a full concert diagram, uh, which includes the patients who were screened. Uh, it does seem, uh, you know, so we, we kind of start at patients who were randomized. And among those who were randomized, it seems that the, the rate of uh, loss to follow up or attrition of outcome adjudication was, was low. Although I don't really know what the uh, attrition was for the heart failure outcomes, though vital status was not known for four patients in the saturated valsartan arm and nine patients in the dimipril or the control arm. So these are like baseline characteristics of the individuals. Uh, based on just the view here, uh, we recognize that the age is on the younger end of the spectrum compared to the patients we see. Uh, as I mentioned before, prior heart failure is excluded. Uh, prior MI uh, was also low, and I believe that is uh, reflected in the prior heart failure exclusion that fewer patients had prior MI and ischemic cardiomyopathy in general. Uh, there was an overrepresentation of uh, cardiovascular risk factors, but that was uh, by design through the risk enhancers that they had included. And uh, the, the predominant, the, another take home message was the STEMI population represented 76% uh, uh, of, of both the uh, randomized arms. Uh, this was also the higher than our current uh, representation, I would believe. And then uh, the, uh, the LVEF was in the 30s, mid 30s mean LVEF. Uh, the patients were receiving DAPT, which is uh, consistent with their presentation with ACS. Uh, beta blocker use and ASR views was, uh, was adequate. However, what was uh, remarkable was that the use of aldosterone and agonists, which have a uh, which have a strong recommendation in trials based on the Ephesus study, uh, was uh, was highly underused among only forty percent of patients. So the primary outcome of CV death, first heart failure hospitalization, or outpatient heart uh, heart failure, uh, was not significantly different between the sacubital valsartan, which is uh, shown by the red line on the bottom, compared with ramipril, which is the blue line on the top. And uh, the, although there are differences uh, that you can see a separation of the curves, I would warn you that the cumulative incidence plots presented in the presentation, this is not the usual zero to one, but zero to point two. So the separation is modest at best, and therefore, which is represented in the fact that uh, the, the uh, significance value was, uh, it's not even close to being significant. And this was, uh, there were subgroup assessments that were presented in the uh, presentation at ACC. And if, if uh, you know, I would take these data with a grain of salt because you, you test so many things and some may be positive by chance alone, but among patients above the age of 65 and those who had PCI at baseline, there was evidence of potential benefit. And there was also evidence of potential benefit uh, if there was uh, uh, atrial fibrillation with the index AMI. The uh, study authors did present two additional outcomes. These were pre-specified, but not among the primary outcomes. These are secondary outcomes. Uh, one of them is the uh, total events. This is similar to the Paragon HF study, where the initial as well as recurrent uh, events were modeled and cumulatively, and the number of events were substantially lower in the saturated valsartan arm, uh, with around 21% reduction in the risk of these events. Again, this is a secondary outcome in a null study, so that has to be taken with a grain of salt. And then there was a second outcome that was presented, which is investigated reported primary endpoint. Uh, the value of this may be slightly lower because it does include events that were not adjudicated or were believed to not represent true events. But this did inflate the sample size and did bring out 
a difference in the dimethyl uh, versus the saturated without sarcomere study terms. Uh, what was a key takeaway for me is that even among this population, uh, adverse events uh, were not different. Uh, the number reported were high for this uh, significant serious adverse events, but I believe this includes any me uh, measure of hypotension or cough and may not actually include individuals who required drug discontinuation because of adverse events, which is, I believe, the key uh, uh, population that we focus on. And uh, even among uh, the significant differences that were there in the true study arms, hypotension was probably the key one with 28% in the sacral valsartner arm compared with about 22% in an allopril arm. Other outcomes were not significantly different in the two study groups. So uh, overall, like renal impairment hyperkalemia were not substantially different in the two study arms. There was a, one key last slide that was presented in the meeting, which I thought was uh, was important, maybe not to our current discussion, but just the idea that how are uh, outcomes among patients who have suffered an MI and have heart failure or LV systolic dysfunction have improved substantially over the last several decades. With, you know, even if you compare the ACE inhibitor arms in the trials that were published in the late 90s and early 2000s to now, which is randomly here, there's a substantial reduction in the events in the population. And the, the authors were presenting this slide as a marker to suggest that there is, you know, maybe we have diminishing returns now to the point that we are not seeing differences, which I believe is, you know, it's more challenging to prove effective therapy, but probably great for patients that we don't, you know, need to aggressively uh, change the course here. So uh, the final take home for, uh, from the study was that sacubital bulsartan did not lower risk of death and clinical heart failure in post-MI LV systolic dysfunction compared with the ACE inhibitor Ramipro. Uh, for me as a practicing clinician, I think it does reduce the, the stress I would take to say, to initiate this therapy right off the bat among patients who have LV systolic dysfunction and follow them out, if uh, especially out to the outpatient follow-up. And if they have persistent dysfunction or persistent heart failure, then the paradigm study would guide me to initiate therapy anyways. Thank you. Rohan, thank you very much uh, for that summary. I think it was very helpful. And then we'll just uh, finish up uh, with uh, Alexandra Lansky. Hi, Dr. Lansky. Hi there. Can you guys see my slides? Yes, we can. Fabulous. Okay, great. So thank you for including me in this uh, in this session. I think it's great to be able to summarize what's, what went on at ACC. So, um, I'm going to be talking about this um, sex-based sub-analysis of the TWILIGHT trial. It was presented by Dr. Vogel at ACC on behalf of the TWILIGHT investigators. For those of you who don't know TWILIGHT or what it was about, basically it was looking at different strategy of dual antiplatelet therapy after high-risk uh, PCI intervention. Essentially, it was following three months of dual antiplatelet therapy with aspirin and ticagrelor, looking at the strategy of monotherapy with ticagrelor alone versus dual antiplatelet, antiplatelet therapy. And essentially it showed um, uh, that with monotherapy, you had a re reduction in bleeding complications without any increase in ischemic events. And the question here of course is how, you know, what are the outcomes uh, based on sex, understanding that female patients typically have higher bleeding complications and higher risk patients and females in particular can have higher ischemic complications as well. Okay, so here's the uh, study design. This was an investigator initiated study uh, sponsored by AstraZeneca. It was randomized, double blind, placebo controlled. They conducted the study at 187 sites in 11 countries, so it was no small feat. Um, these were high-risk patients uh, undergoing PCI and were treated with three months of duantiplatelet therapy with ticagrelor and aspirin. I think it's important to understand that there was this roll-in phase. Um, patients had to be event-free and adherent to duantiplatelet therapy before randomization to either aspirin or placebo and continued uh, ticagrelor for uh, up to 12 months. So taking a look here at the number of patients, initially there were 9,000 patients enrolled, 28% were female, 
And then um, after the roll-in phase at three months, they lost about 2,000 patients and disproportionately lost more female patients, 24% uh, were, were female. At this point, they randomized patients again in a double blind placebo controlled fashion and followed patients out to 12 months. Uh, patients had to have at least one clinical and one angiographic criteria that classified them as high risk. You can see here the clinical criteria was based on age above 65, female sex, um, ACS, uh, a history of vascular disease, diabetes, or chronic kidney disease, and any one of these angiographic criteria, either multivessel disease, lung lesions, thrombotic lesions, uh, bifurcations requiring two stent strategy, left main or calcified lesions. Importantly, they excluded patients with ST elevation myocardial inf infarction, uh, rescue angioplasty, or any need for chronic oral anticoagulation. So here are the primary endpoints for the study. There were two. The primary safety endpoint was looking at uh, bark bleeding, two, three, and five. I added here a table showing sort of the definitions. Essentially, this includes any um, actionable bleeding. So that's type two. Type three is more severe. Type five is fatal bleeding. They excluded from this endpoint cabbage-related bleeds. Um, and then the ischemic endpoint is here. It's a composite of all cause death, non-fatal MI and non-fatal stroke. So looking at the patient characteristics, I think it's no surprise there's some differences between the men and women. We, we know these uh, women were older, they had more diabetes treated with insulin, chronic kidney disease, anemia and hypertension. They had less um, smoking. Uh, there were more women with acute coronary syndromes and less uh, prior myocardial infarction, PCI, and bypass surgery. In general, they had less multivessel disease and less and fewer lesions actually treated compared to male patients. So here's the primary safety endpoint, again, BARC 2, 3, or 5. You can see that this is unadjusted, but you can see that there's about a 30% increase overall in uh, bleeding complications in the female patients. The accrual is pretty steady over time, and um, you see the increase um, at one year. Um, after adjustment for, base, for differences in baseline characteristics, the differences in bleeding were no longer significant. Here's the uh, outcomes in terms of the ischemic endpoints. You're looking at death, MI, and stroke. There was absolutely no difference between men and women uh, at 12 months in terms of ischemic complications. And here are the um, outcomes, so the treatment effect uh, in terms of bleeding um, and you can see the very similar treatment effect here. This is the adjusted hazard ratio for both men and women, about a 40% reduction in overall bleeding with the use of ticagrelor mon monotherapy. Uh, here, the uh, actual event rates and interaction p-value was negative. He, this is looking at the ischemic endpoints, death, MI, and stroke. Again, no differences here between the groups uh, and negative interaction p-value. Uh, so interestingly, while the ischemic composite was not different between men and women, what you do see here is uh, in a pre-specified uh, analysis here, looking at all cause mortality, it seems that female patients actually have a lower all-cause death with the use of ticagrelor monotherapy compared to male patients. And you can see that this, of all these tests, this was the only one that had a positive interaction p-value. These are the absolute differences in bleeding complications with the use of monotherapy. So 3.6% uh, reduction for females, 2.9% reduction for males. Uh, overall pretty similar. 
So just in terms of the conclusions here um, and implications, um, I think the conclusions for patients who are stable after three months of duanti platelet therapy with ticagrelor and aspirin for high-risk PCI, ticagrelor monotherapy reduces bleeding complications without increasing in, uh, ischemic compli complications. And the benefit of monotherapy is similar for men and women. And I think um, certainly, you know, as it uh, applies to our practice in general, I would say that the se selection and duration of antiplatelet therapy after PCI should be tailored to the patient's ischemic and bleeding risk after PCI. Uh, keeping in, in mind, uh, at least based on this analysis, that women in general have about a 30% higher bleeding risk compared to male patients, and that eliminating aspirin after uh, three months will reduce bleeding complications by about 40% without increasing ischemic complications. Thank you. Excellent. Um, thank you so much for that talk, uh, Dr. Lansky. And we have probably enough time, and I have to thank all the speakers for really being uh, very succinct in their presentations. We probably have time for one or two questions and some clarifications. So I'll uh, open the floor here for questions. Yes, go ahead. Uh, Ryan and Tarek, you had some quick clarifications you wanted to make. Yeah, I just wanted to add the, uh, I just added some of the uh, comment about the uh, Triluminate study that we're involved in here at Yale with just, just launching and enrolling patients. So patients with symptomatic, moderate or more TR were, we'd like to have a look at and see if they'd be candidates for the trial. Uh, but I also did mention some of the co-apt results, um, you know, just in patients with uh, moderate to severe or severe TR uh, with dilated left ventricles and reduced ejection fractions. Uh, if they're still symptomatic despite optimal medical therapy uh, that uh, uh, was mentioned, the number needed to treat was uh, three uh, to prevent a hospitalization and number needed to treat was uh, six to prevent one death at 24 months. So pretty uh, a big impact in patients who've been optimized on medical therapy. So just uh, uh, kind of mentioning that in the chat box. Excellent, thank you so much. Um, Dr. Manny, Aria, you had a question. I apologize that I, I cut off a little earlier. Um, oh, I, can, I can ask him later, then, then no worries. Uh, okay. All right. So I just want to uh, take the time uh, to thank again all of the faculty um, who came through to kind of put this program together. Uh, Jim Freeman, Ryan Capel, Tariq Ahmad, uh, Rohan Kira, Alexander Lansky. Thank you guys very much. I think this was excellent, very high yield um, hour and summary of uh, key highlights from ACC 2021. And uh, just to say again, thank you to Eric Velasquez for the great idea. And we will be taking volunteers uh, for the major uh, meetings, the AHA, um, maybe the European meeting so that we can have these summaries and keep everyone uh, up to speed as well. Well, thank you all. And uh, we hope to see you uh, next week where we have Wendy Book uh, from Emory uh, giving grand rounds. Thank you.